global health worker, a clinician and an advocate, as well as an educator. And I come to talk to you about the condom and the corn. I speak from my own experience. I travel with several gifted members of the medical and educational community, and I speak about my own experience and my own perception today. I typically travel all around the world, uh, many different locations, but today, for today's purpose, I'll be speaking about my work in Guyana. I work in Guyana in the area of family planning, in a clinical setting. I work as a clinician and as an educator. In terms of my own background, I come from a long tradition of humanitarian aid workers, a family of mental health professionals, educators, and advocates. My greatest inspiration comes from my father, um, a human rights advocate and a judge for many years on an immigration and refugee tribunal in Canada. He's a great bringer together of people and ideas. And in the spirit of Ted, I think it's appropriate that I mention him. Now the work that I actually do is in several locations, academic locations and in the bush. The tr conditions that I travel in are rough. And as I was speaking to a friend of mine, a physician who comes with me on my trips, she said, are you really going to be honest with this audience? I mean, do they really need to know what you look like on day one, two, or three, and then beyond on these types of trips? <laughs> where you're not bathing except for the use of this wonderful invention called wet wipes. <laughs> you're not really eating very much except for power bars. Sometimes delicious on day one, less so on day 16. But I decided in the spirit of full disclosure, I would share with you what my experience actually is. A dear friend of mine, a nurse on the trip, Vince Chang, decided he was going to capture some of the experiences we have on each trip in cartoons. On one of the first days, I said, if I get one more bite on my body, I don't know how I'm going to continue in this environment. If only I had a condom large enough to put my entire body in. <laughs> I spend all my time distributing condoms, but none big enough for me. <laughs> and then there's the lack of things green. The things we take for granted. A delicious apple, a salad, anything that does not come out of something shrink-wrapped and packaged. But this is what the bush looks like. The interior of Guyana, very beautiful. And these are some of the homes that some of the individuals in the communities we work with in Guyana live in. This is a woman, a dear friend of mine, who is preparing dinner. The staple of the diet is the cassava plant or root. And she typically carries around her children, her groceries, everything she needs to take around with her in this varshi, which is also made out of the fibers of a cassava plant. The cassava also makes these bread-like discs. And this is, again, another view of a kitchen. The clinics that we work in look different depending on where we are. Now, this is a very sophisticated, fancy, Western-like clinic. This is how it was described to me as I was planning one of my first trips. And the reason it fits those categories in that description is because there's something really amazing in this picture. It's called a roof. A roof is really a very exciting thing to have in the interior where it rains almost every single day, really rain of biblical proportions. As we plan these types of trips, we really need to ask ourselves how we best align health care delivery within a social context. The social context is of the utmost importance because there's no global health situation that's identical. And that's why I said at the very beginning, I'm speaking about a specific situation. I certainly do not want to lump them all together. I focus on innovation, creativity, sharing ideas, education, in my mind, the best way of bringing about change, setting realistic goals, relationship building, collaboration, patience, and flexibility. I think a number of people today who've done similar work have spoken a lot about flexibility. We work with dreamers and visionaries. Both are important. Both are difficult to work with. Yeah. <laughs> now, innovation can mean many different things in many different settings. But in the global health setting, we really have to ask ourselves, how are we going to implement? How are we going to get from fundraising and pill packing and pre-trip situations and, of course, academic theorizing, which is my day job, to setting up a clinic in very remote parts of the world. 
How do we go from this to this? <laughs> Very different environments. And sometimes this. <laughs> Before we go on the trip, there's a tremendous amount of planning. And a lot of this starts really at the idea building stage. Lots of brainstorming, using many different people from many different backgrounds. We fundraise, we collect different supplies, medical and otherwise. We pack our pills in tiny little Ziploc bags. It's a big question about how our medical impact influences our environmental impact on these trips. We sign every waiver you could possibly dream up in your mind and consent forms, and we pack. We take almost all of our belongings in a pack on our backs. We typically put them in dry bags due to the rain situation and the bug situation, and we take off. But we also, before we take off, have to think about how we're going to get donations. I typically will write to a number of different countries. Um, companies, different institutions to get donations. Most recently, I had a friend staying over at my apartment in Cambridge, and I said, if the doorbell rings, just answer the door. I've been getting a lot of donations by mail. And he said, okay. And the doorbell rings, and the guy's at the door. My friend answers the door, and he goes, way to go, man. My friend didn't have any idea what he was talking about and took the package inside. When he opened the package, yeah. <laughs> he found a donation of about 2,000 condoms and said, I don't know if I can stay here anymore. <laughs> this is pretty much what my mail look like, looks like about a year before each trip. The most important pre-trip detail really comes down to sending out a scout to assess immediate needs and long-term needs in the places that we're going to. We can sit and theorize in our comfortable, nice environments all we want about what people um, in various communities need. But truly, we only can really understand where need lies when we have very simple conversations with locals. We typically send out a scout. We figure out where we're going to go, depending on the rain season, depending on how transportation can actually get us from place A to place B. And most importantly, we make sure that all of the grass is burned in every location that we go to. Otherwise, we have serious snake problems. And in the teams that we travel in, low budget missions, we typically take one anti-venom. So it's a cause for concern and definitely cause to be very careful. The art of listening. This is probably the single most important thing that goes into planning each trip that we go on. Truly listening, active listening. Truly trying to understand where needs lie. We're a group of medical and public health professionals. Usually take around 22 people in all. A group of nurses, physiotherapists, infectious disease doctors, a schlepper, very important person on the trip who puts up tents, drags everything around. Healthcare workers, a dental therapist and a nurse that are typically from the local community. And a local cook, Auntie Irene, probably the favorite of each trip. This is our before picture. I think we look a little bit apprehensive, a little nervous, but overall okay. This is the during picture and I've spared you the after shot. <laughs> We take along with us a lab with a centrifuge, with stained materials. There are no chairs, typically, where we travel. And chairs are actually a very difficult thing to bring along with you. So we have very physically adept lab pets who um, create incredible environments to work in. I do family planning. This is my most important tool besides for my resources and materials. We work with local health workers. Local health workers are invaluable. They possess a wealth of information and narrative. And of course, make the interactions that we have with locals much more comfortable, especially <laughs> in my business. Our health workers organize the medications that they have from our mission and various other donations on simple shelves. If we're conducting a clinic outside, we typically use poles or trees, bed sheets, and clothes pens. Um, in these situations, we bring all of our drugs with us in suitcases. Some of our wonderful health workers and our cook. The dental therapist can only perform extractions. Now, we saw a short film before about a chipped tooth and the cost that goes into dentistry in general. And this dental therapist was trained as such as a dental therapist. It's a family position passed on from generation to generation. And he pulls teeth all day. He is not the favorite of the children. <laughs> and this is our pharmacy. 
We typically organize our drugs in various open suitcases. Everything is packed in Ziploc bags. And we have one pharmacist who comes with us on the trip. She is a favorite of um, all patients and, um, and all physicians who basically use her as just another physician most of the time. How do we get there? Caribbean Airlines gives us a wonderful break on the cost of our flights. But that's really just the beginning of the journey. Typically, as all the doctors pile onto this Caribbean Airline flight, there's some kind of medical emergency on board. And on the overhead speaker, somebody says, is there a doctor on board? <laughs> and nobody raises their hands. <laughs> It's really a very pathetic way to start any trip. <laughs> they put up with us. We usually take a shuttle from the airport to a dock, then take a boat to another airport, and then get on a very safe, very state-of-the-art <laughs> plane. <laughs> to get onto this plane, you have to be weighed. It's sometimes a demoralizing experience. <laughs> and your weight will be redistributed depending on how much you weigh. <laughs> Not a favorite. And that's what the plane looks like when it's in the air. It feels very safe. <laughs> we typically walk with our packs or back and forth to the camp. Sometimes we use very sophisticated bridges and pulley systems to cross large bodies of water with all of our supplies to get to the camp. All of the gear that we bring, the entire pharmacy, the entire lab, Absolutely everything will typically be taken from the water's edge up quite a hike to the nearby village. Typically the locals are very helpful and it's a really wonderful sort of welcome slash warning uh, to newcomers. Now, Guyana, as some of you may know, gained its independence in the 70s. There's a mainland, which is capital of Georgetown. And, and the interior, which houses the Amerindian population. And this is the population that we primarily serve. Guyana is between Venezuela, Brazil, and Suriname. And quick stuff. There's a mining industry in Guyana. This, of course, causes much water pollution, which means the water is not drinkable. And if anybody has known about the slight glitch in Guyanese history in the 70s, this is why it's sometimes difficult for us to get doctors to come with us on our trips. Mm -hmm. The medical system is divided into five categories, most of which have just basic medical ability. Um, and we come in and offer really acute care, but in terms of hospital care, there really isn't very much. So complicated medical procedures need to be outsourced, typically to Trinidad and Tobago. The leading cause of morbidity is cardiovascular disease and HIV AIDS. And in terms of our own personal trip, although we do research on rheumatic fever, we really focus on HIV AIDS. We hit the ground running, as I already said, setting up the clinic, and we have a pretty basic triage intake system. The patients come from far and wide, some of which are villages upstream. They travel long distances to get to us, and this is what our basic camp looks like. We travel on this open barge, and one year we invested in this big blue tarp, which helped us as it poured rain for the entire trip on the open barge, the blue tarp. We work with public health and hygiene and water purification. It's been my experience that if we set our goals in a very realistic way, we can accomplish much more. For example, taking empty soda bottles, painting them black, <coughs> filling them with water as an arts and crafts project in the school. These water bottles, if they are put outside in the sun in very hot weather, after about eight hours, this water is actually clean and pure water. This can be pure drinking water, and with a pinch of salt and a pinch of sugar, it can be an oral rehydration fluid. So these very practical methods and of course, we work a great deal on safer sex practices. Oral hygiene, our wonderful students. Sometimes students just like to come in and say hi, and they say, can you check me? Sure. <laughs> now, the real question comes from a case study. As an ethicist, I do a lot of my teaching and learning about case studies. The first year I came to Guyana, I got there, and the people who had come the year before in terms of public health and giving out prophylaxis and sexual health materials said, we've been really successful in Guyana. I said, great. I met the first community of people, and the men came up to me and they said, we really want to talk to you about condoms. Now this basically never happens. I mean, this doesn't happen here, it doesn't happen there. <laughs> men don't really want to talk about condoms very much. And I was shocked. I followed the men, they said, we really want to show you what we do with them. I said, I have a pretty good idea what you do with them. <laughs> no worries, I don't need to know. And they took me out to the field and they said, we're going to show you right here. And I thought to myself, okay. 
and they showed me that they covered each cob of corn in their field with a condom to protect the corn from pestilence. <laughs> now, condoms can be used for many different things. <laughs> this was not exactly our intended outcome. But did we go wrong and did we fail or were we successful? It's really difficult to say. It was certainly innovative on their part, but I'm not sure it achieved exactly what we were looking for. And just very quickly, I'll talk about the four theories of global health, one of which is unintended consequences, which is when the consequence of what you try to do did not really come about, but in this case, it wasn't necessarily negative. Um, and of course, taking into consideration social suffering as well as biopower. In terms of some of my work, at with anthropologists, uh, an important piece to keep in mind is the local moral experience. And that's really what we try to cater to. The individual experience, the experience um, in local places, and that is the only way, in my mind, to bring about sustainable, respectful, and effective health. As an ethicist, I, co I continuously look to the four principles of bioethics, autonomy, non-maleficence, non doing no harm, sort of Hippocratic oath, beneficence, actually doing something positive, and, and overall justice. Ethics comes in in a number of ways, not the least of which is the numerous times we try to do small research projects and bring them back to Canada or the US. One of the physicians asked, said to me, you know, I don't really have the protocol, the ethics protocol, to study this particular bug, but I know you have one lodged in your foot, so please, let's not take it out on this trip, but when we're in the airport back in Toronto, we'll take it out. These are the kinds of things that happen if you don't go through important ethics protocol before the trip. And of course, keeping in mind informed consent at all times. <laughs> Field work is of the utmost importance. It is almost impossible to truly understand global health and the needs of global health situations from the academy or from the Western world. So creating these relationships, these bonds, creates sustainability. But it's not easy, and even health workers need care at times. Sometimes care workers might indulge in cassava beer, warm, very delicious. <laughs> and of course, there's those simple things in the interior that can make us very happy. Our goals really are to assess health and support work, family planning, and to of course always assess our success and failures. We've been working in Guyana for 17 years. We take approximately three trips a year, and we've almost entirely eradicated elephantiasis, filariasis, and malaria. This has not been done by our trip alone. This has truly been done by the workers and the local people in terms of, as well as education. I know I'm running out of time, so I'll just say very quickly, a great deal of our work is with HIV AIDS prevention, providing HIV meds, access to prophylaxis and maternal health and nutrition. These are the number of patients we see on any given trip. And of course, as I said before, with very simple measures like distributing bed nets, using purified water access, we have really <coughs> been able to make a very practical difference, again, in this setting. This is just an example of the lines of hordes of women, some very curious boys when it comes to family planning, and just some of the struggles that we go through when we're trying to triage patients. We try to do our education in very casual ways, sometimes in a waiting area. And through this partnership, we really hope to achieve our ultimate goal, which is really just to come back as visitors and see the wonderful Kaitor Falls, the single largest drop waterfall, I believe, in the world. I know Matthew wants to be gone. My grandmother is a very important person in this talk because my grandmother always said, don't be so open-minded that you let your brains fall out. <laughs> <laughs> I take this to mean a number of different things in a global health setting, one of which is true communication, but bringing what we have from our host communities in order to help the communities that we go to. Not to expect to do too much, no complicated surgeries in the bush or in the interior. And of course, be present. Know that you cannot fix everything. Most of the times, you cannot fix anything. Build relationships, plan for inclement weather, and inclement people. <laughs> if I could put everything that I brought with me into a condom, I would feel much better at the end of these trips. And of course, getting home, it's normal to feel relieved and exhausted, thankful and sad, tired, but this is the most important time to really decompress and think about how to be truly innovative and implement on the next trip. And with that, I will say that the ultimate message is, justice, justice, we shall pursue. If you can save or help one person, it's as if you've saved the entire world. Thank you very much.